Chapter 86 The city below a lake, below the water dome which reflected the blue sky like an aquarium in whimsical shapes. One location stood out with a higher transit of people compared to the rest. That was the market, where many merchants sold items indispensable for both adventurers and a common person's daily life. There was clearly also a large group of merchants who supported the 50 bells. The entire market street was filled to the scenes with shops, which had signs placed in front to make it easier to know what they all sold. And there were also smaller stalls scattered around. Mira walked down that street while constantly looking around. This looks like a very prosperous place. The people passing alongside Mira had very varying appearances, giving the entire place the same feeling as some sort of festival. She could see members of different races, men, guardia, dwarves and elves, as well as more rare species like fairies, dragonborns, and demons. Their clothing was also very varied, some having practical armor or worn-out equipment. If there was a way to describe all of them, they looked like a large conglomerate of adventurers. There were others who wore more colorful and peculiarly shaped native costumes, or engineers wearing their distinctive aprons. On top of that, there were some wearing shirts, pants, and even the occasional tracksuit. Mixed between that varied flow of people, there were also spirits floating around. The coupon Mira obtained from Kagura was quickly turned into a large quantity of food. After she stored it all, wondering if she really needed so much, she began strolling around leisurely, looking at different weapon and medicine shops, seeing how they had changed since the game era. From a certain stand, a particular scent wafted into the sea of people. When it reached Mira, she stopped walking and turned towards its source, walking up to that stand. Huh, isn't that? The scent was stronger there, and as she looked inside she saw that young spirit she met in a forest of praying children, the same who was chasing a butterfly around that lake where she first met someone from the fifty bells. Now it was playing around, chasing the particular pattern of light on the ground which came from the sun passing through the lake's surface. Mira felt relief seeing the young spirit, knowing it had been safely guarded by the fifty bells after she left it back then. It was then that Mira felt an impact from behind which sent her falling to the ground. What was that? She lifted her head and looked around. Ah, I'm so sorry, really. There was an immediate reply from behind her. Then she felt a pair of arms hoist her by the sides and pick her up. When Mira turned around, she saw a woman with light purple braided hair and a robe of bright and pale colors. The woman, who had a rather young-looking face, continued apologizing while desperately dusting off Myra's clothes. Don't worry, it was nothing. As she spoke, Mira stared intently at the woman's face. Something felt off, or rather, she felt she had seen that woman somewhere before, or at least someone similar. Once the dusting was over, the woman looked straight at Mira before squeezing her in a hug. What are you? While feeling an inexplicable lump of something soft pressing against her face from across the robe, Mira was shocked from a sudden hug, instinctively attempting to escape the embrace. Ah, uh, sorry. I suddenly felt like the woman pulled her arms back, though they still loitered in the air emptily wishing to hug Mira. Meanwhile Mira thought more about the sensation she felt on her cheek and also drooped her shoulders in regret. A man then hesitantly spoke to those two who looked at each other with dejected looks. Lynn. I finally found you, and what are you even doing? The woman called Lynn replied with I ran into her, and then seemed to remember something as she placed her hand on Myra's body. Her touch was gentle while a white glow enveloped her hand. I'm sorry. Are you hurt? I'm really sorry. That glow on Lynn's hand was something produced from monk skills. As she touched Myra's body, even the slight bruises that really did not bother her vanished with a slight glow. The man was able to largely guess what had happened, so he poked at Lynn's head once she was done healing Mira. Were you walking around while looking at spirits unaware of your surroundings again? Seriously. He appeared to have guessed correctly, as Lynn simply nodded without making excuses, apologizing after a while bowing to Mira. But as soon as she lifted her head and saw Mira, she once again hugged her tightly. What should I do with her? This time she did not resist the embrace, but she asked the man while looking at him out of Lynn's arms. This time she had no ulterior thoughts though. Mira had noticed a certain sadness in Lynn, so she decided to let her do as she pleased. You can't do that, Lynn. The man spoke softly like whispering, and Lynn slowly and reluctantly let go of Mira, heaving a deep sigh afterwards. He appeared to be in his early thirties and had a rather lean body. His hair was golden like ripe rice straws and was cut short. He only carried some light equipment, and two swords dangled on each side of his hips. He had almond eyes, as well as slender glasses, which overall gave him a reserved and intelligent appearance. Either way, he was a rather handsome man as well. I'm Ashley, and she's my wife Lynn. It seems she's been a bit rude to you, so I apologize for her. He bowed after introducing himself, looking honestly sorry for anything that might have happened. Don't worry about it. It seems she has her reasons too. Her actions had been largely unexpected, so there was no harm in Mira getting curious about her, and it was hard for her not to after seeing the two apologize so many times. Thank you. Ashley bowed again, looking slightly pained as he continued talking. As I mentioned, we're a married couple, but we also have a son who should be turning 10 this year. But because of certain reasons we haven't been able to see him in many years now, it seems that has affected her greatly as now she always gets distracted seeing infant spirits, or she impulsively hugs children who would be around the same age as him. She's run into people countless times before as well, and I try to talk to her about it every time. As he said that, Ashley gently held Lynn against him. His actions were like those of someone protecting something, or protecting her of something. That sounds like a complicated situation. Lynn would get easily distracted when seeing young spirits, thinking about her own son, and would run into people, and because of a similar reason she had hugged Mira only because of her young appearance. Knowing about her situation now, Mira felt some pity for her, as well as curiosity to know more about them. There had to be a reason why they could not meet their beloved son after such a long time. I hope I'm not being too bothersome or nosy, but could you tell me more? You're not a bother at all. Hearing Mira, Ashley nodded without hesitating, slowly letting go of his wife before plopping a hand on her head. Lynn is a half-elf half-spirit. Oh. I see. Hearing that, Mira looked at Lynn again, and when she noticed that stare, Lynn spread her arms wide with a bright as if inviting Mira to jump into her arms. It appeared that Lynn did not mind at all if they spoke about her either, so having confirmed that much, Mira turned back to look at Ashley. Meanwhile Lynn silently let her hands go down again while hanging her head down. I don't know if you heard this before, but half spirits are born with special abilities, and Lynn was born with the ability to attract very strong spirits to herself. That obviously caused her to be targeted by Chimera, so shortly after we were taken in by the fifty bells and we've been here since then. Saying that, Ashley turned to look around at that city built below a lake, while also scoffing at himself for being too weak to protect those who he loved but they haven't given up on taking her yet and they deployed an observation network shortly after, so we don't know where their eyes might be. If we carelessly go out and they happen to see us with our son, they'll know who he is, and knowing how they act, 
Bale probably do something with him so Lynn does as they wish. That's why it's best if we don't interact with our son until this battle is over. Ashley also longed to see his son, so he could sympathize with Lynn's actions as he placed a hand on Myra's head. As Ashley had mentioned, those born from a mix of spirits in another race would inherit peculiar powers, and out of all of them, Ashley got one which was incredibly useful for someone like Chimera Claus and to accomplish their goal faster. Because of that, Lynn was relentlessly pursued by them. Even when she was being brought to the 50 Bells headquarters they were attacked countless times. As a result, they were unable to take her son as well, while also not allowing a shred of evidence of their relationship to be noticed. Now that Mira knew the circumstances they were in, she silently let them pat her head. Hey, Ashley and Lynn, and the young lady is with you as well. Arlen spotted the three, who looked like a happy small family from afar. He was there to buy supplies as well, and apparently Ashley and Lynn were common acquaintances with him as they greeted him in return. I guess your wife went into another of her episodes. Arlen glanced at Mira, whose hair was completely disheveled from all the padding, before looking at Ashley who had a more composed look. The way Lynn would blindly follow young spirits before running into someone else, or the way she would hug children as soon as she saw them were a well-known occurrence there. Since Mira fit perfectly into the appearance Lynn seeked, Arlen could guess exactly what happened. But these hardships won't last much longer. We're about to head on a very important mission which should greatly change the situation, and even the end of all this might be near. I'm sure you'll meet your son soon. Arlen declared that with a confident voice, which took Ashley and Lynn by surprise, who looked at each other before exclaiming really, with a very hopeful voice. Yes, it's true. A very strong helper has arrived to lend us a hand as well. Do you know who that young girl is? Oh right, I haven't even asked for your name. Ashley spoke as if just remembering something, looking straight at the silver-haired girl, while Lynn looked at her with passion as well, having their attention focused on her. Mira puffed her chest and pointed at her cheek while saying I'm Mira with a prideful voice. You've probably heard how there's a lot of Chimera members being captured lately, that was all thanks to her, and she's strong enough that Eva Zoom recognizes her strength, knowing all that is really reassuring, isn't it? Arlen ended his sentence with a bright grin. He was normally a calm and composed person, so him smiling was a rare sight. Seeing that, Ashley and Lynn could only smile as well. That's good to know. She does sound really dependable. Ashley spoke in the light after his eyes went round with admiration. Uzum or Kagura was the commander of the 50 Bells Union, and everyone under her respected and admired her power. Some even feared it. Because of that her criteria to judge someone's power was really picky, commanding only a handful of A-rank adventurers who were at the top, or people with comparable skills. After staring at the silver-haired girl clad in cutesy clothes, Ashley looked up towards the sky covered with the lake's surface, laughing vacantly at just how many surprises that vast world held before heaving a deep sigh. You can trust me, and I vow that I'll make all of this end shortly, so just bear with it for a little longer. Mira was still too young to understand just how hard it was for a parent to be unable to meet their son, but she knew more than enough how hard it was for a child to be away from their parents. Mira was aware of the risks involved with promising something important like that, but she just had to say that. We'll see him shortly, just a little longer. Then closed her eyes in relief after staring at Mira for a long while, having heard her promise without a speck of doubt. Then she brought her hands together against her chest, as if protecting something very dear to her. Ashley put his hand on Lena's shoulder, turning to Mira and Arlen thanking them silently by lightly bowing to them. You heard her, I'm sure knowing this was the best news you could hear. With that, Arlen glanced one last time at the couple before leaving towards the market to finish his preparations for the next day. His eyes during his last look were sharp, but filled with kindness, like the shine of a knight's sword. Well, that's about it. Just do everything you can do inside here in the meantime. Mira could guess how they might feel, being unable to leave the headquarters, so she said that before going on her way as well. Ashley was also known to Chimera Clausen, so he could not go out either, as much as he wished to be part of missions that went outside. In the end, he and Lena remained there as they saw Mira off, praying in their hearts. The street lights were barely starting to be lit when Mira headed back to the palace, walking while thinking about Ashley and Lena. Hmm. Ashley and Lena, I feel like I heard that somewhere before. She felt a certain familiarity with those names, but no matter how much she prodded at her big memories nothing came out. Having finished almost all of her shopping, Mira returned to the inner palace, where a maid then led her through an inner corridor, at the end of which the 50 Bells Union commander's personal room was located. Kagura was waiting inside, wearing a plain and completely different get-up as before. Somehow you look more like your old self now. Mira was the first one to speak, seeing Kagura's new attire. I mean, I feel way more comfortable in these. Kagura, wearing a red tracksuit, lifted her eyes from the papers in front of her and looked at Mira. So, did you finish your preparations? Pretty much. I see. Kagura replied shortly while standing up, grabbing a cushion from a mountain of them in a corner of the room, and placing it to the side of her table. I want to hear stories from Grandpa now. As she returned to her earlier spot, Kagura spoke with the same curious look of a small child. I also had some things I wanted to ask you. Mira had also been wanting to ask something similar, wondering what kind of lifestyle Kagura led in this world. They were thinking the same, so Mira sat down in front of Kagura and they began talking. After that they spoke at length about their various experiences in that world. Mira could only tell stories from the last month or so, while Kagura had a whole decade to pull from. Mira heard even more details of the foundation of the 50 Bells Union, while also getting Kagura to promise she would return as one of the nine elders of Arkite when everything was resolved with Chimera Clausen, and Kagura made Mira promise she would help with everything she could to accomplish the 50 Bells goal. After that the conversation delved into more mundane topics, and by the time Kagura began pressuring Mira to talk about Luna. The pure rabbit she brought to the tower, a maid came to announce the bath was ready. Well, I'll go take a bath then, I hope you'll fill me in with everything about Luna later. Saying that, Kagura headed to the bathroom first. As soon as the door she left through was closed, a profound stillness filled the room. That made Mira take another look around the room. There was a circular table in the middle, while multiple bookshelves were placed against the walls and a conical lamp was hung from the ceiling, illuminating the entire room. There were some plants growing in one corner, then mist grass that was activated by the lamp. It's a pretty well-kept room. That was the impression Mira got since she had seen Kagura's real room in the past. She idly stared at the mist coming from the corner when she randomly remembered what she did the night before. 
I have nothing else to do, so I might as well go do that before I take a bath. Deciding that, she jumped on her feet and left Kagura's room. After loitering around for a while trying to find her way, Mir finally arrived at the garden where she faced Sasori, which was slightly illuminated by the light bleeding from the corridors. Shortly after an orb of light appeared and dispelled the remaining darkness, thanks to Myra's concept magic. Standing on ogre colored ground, Mir took a deep breath and readied her stance to start training. A considerable amount of time had passed since Mira started training when Sasori came to the garden, curious since it usually was much darker at that hour. There, she saw Mira moving around with a dexterity unimaginable from a spellcaster, a silver after image following her as she darted through the air. Isn't that... Mira, is she practicing some form of martial arts? Her movements look a bit like Anna. At first it looked like she was simply practicing a defined set of movements, but then every once in a while she would weave in summoning or sage attacks, forming an unpredictable and powerful pattern of attacks. Who would have guessed you could move like that as well? Is that any particular style? Driven by her curiosity, Sasori climbed a hedge around the garden and landed inside without making a single noise, then asking with intense eyes. Well, yes, though I'd forgotten its name. Sasori was silent like a cat, which surprised Mira as she replied. I see said Sasori, lowering her shoulders in disappointment. Did you learn that from Dan Bolf as well? Well... Pretty much. In reality it had been Meilin, the sage wise man who had taught her that. Her reply had a pretty bad tone to it, but Sasori did not seem to mind, instead changing the topic while looking genuinely enthusiastic. By the way, do you want a partner to train with? I can help you if you're training your body. Saying that, rather than preparing herself to train she leapt into the air, doing an entire flip before landing at the appropriate distance from Mira. Considering how little preparation she had before jumping, that just went to show how much power her legs had. Mira was already well aware of her strength though, given that she had defeated more than ten dark knights in direct combat. As long as physical strength went, she was probably even stronger than Mira. Hmm. Mira took another breath, looking at Sasori in front of her, before lifting the corners of her lips into a smile. I'll take this as an opportunity to learn a thing or two then. Hearing Myra's words of assent, Sasori's face lit up. She threw all the concealed weapons she had on her to the ground. That's what I should be saying. With that, their sparring began. Mira used no spells, while Sasori put her skills and weapons aside, fighting purely with their physical strength. Their training continued until a maid came to tell them the bathroom was available. The two had been so engrossed in their sparring that the moment they heard the maid both collapsed, Mira fell back on her knees, looking at the sky while wiping the sweat from her forehead with her sleeves. Sasori's back bent forwards, her shoulders moving up and down with every breath as she looked at the drops of sweat falling down to the ground, ignoring all of the sweat still clinging to her body. After that Mira followed the maid to the bathroom, and Sasori followed her like it was the most obvious thing to do. The bathroom of the inner palace was entirely made of stone, looking almost like a cave. The bathtub was large and filled with hot water, big enough to easily fit ten people. The sound from the drops of condensed steam that fell from the rustic ceiling was overpowered by the noise of a stream of hot water that resembled a waterfall. Overall, the water produced a pleasant tone that filled the entire room, together with a humid air that clung to one's body like a thin piece of silk. HMHM, she has a nice and lean body. Her view was slightly obstructed by white steam, but Mira still observed every corner of Sasori's body while nodding to herself satisfied. As their bodies soaked in the bathtub, they began talking about habits or openings they noticed in each other during their training. Their voices more enthusiastic than the water was hot. The bathroom was a wondrous place that let people be themselves, but the voices in this one spoke of things with no charm, but were loaded with plenty of passion. Some time after their exchange of opinions reached its peak, their bath time came to an end when one of them was unable to suppress the cry of hunger of their stomachs. After that they bid each other a good night and Sasori returned to her personal room. On the other hand, Mira put on the bathrobe ready for her and was taken by a maid to Kagura's room. When the maid opened the door, a scent wafted out which aroused Myra's stomach even more. Kagura's table was filled with colorful and well-made plates of food. Hurry hurry. On the other side of the table, Kagura was sitting wearing her tracksuit, urging Mira to sit down. She had been waiting for Mira to finish bathing, so she was also really hungry. Even the food looks magnificent here. Seeing that feast laid in front of her, Mira claimed the empty cushion and sat on it, nimbly like a cat. Afterwards she looked straight at Kagura, the master of that room. Kagura had a welcoming look for her friend she dearly missed, even though she had a different appearance now. Their dinner began after a toast in celebration of their re-encounter. 